side is up. Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 through verse 29. And the word of the Lord today reads from the King James text. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel yufarsen. This is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. And Pyrrhus, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. The king of Babylon began to engage in a celebration in which he brought in the uh, articles from the temple of God in Jerusalem and he began to use the holy things of God in an unholy way as part of his celebration. And during this celebration, a, a vision appeared to those that were in the celebration hall and the vision was that of a large hand. And the hand began to write on the wall, and it wrote the words, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Eupharsin. And the king did not understand what these words meant. He had no idea what was trying to be communicated to him. So he called for the wise men in his kingdom to come, and no one was able to tell him what these words meant. Until finally he received word there was a Jewish captive, a young man or a man who was able possibly to discern what this message was. And he brought in the prophet Daniel. And Daniel began to read the words and he began to interpret them for the king. And in the course of the interpretation he is telling the king that God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. So the destruction of Babylon is here prophesied. But I want to focus today primarily on the second part of this message. Tekel, T-E-K-E-L. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. A lot of people today, if you've grown up in a fundamentalist or in an evangelical camp, then you have probably been taught that the gospel of Jesus Christ is all about black and white. Everything is heaven or hell. Everything is exaltation or destruction. There is no middle ground. Everything is clear. If you do this, you're lost. If you do that, you're lost. The grace of God has been lost in a message of legalism within most of the evangelical and fundamentalist camp, as well as various other religious organizations. And the Spirit of the Lord has been speaking to me in recent weeks about the subject that I'm embarking upon today. You see, we talk about the issue of justice. And in America, justice is oftentimes uh, lost. We see people getting away with things they ought not to be getting away with. And we see people being severely punished for things that really are not that deserving of severe punishment. I've seen videos of a black man being pulled over by a police officer. And uh, the police officer is going to the car to question him or talk to him, whatever the case might be. And suddenly this rather portly black man, probably in his 40s or 50s maybe, but I think probably in his 40s, 
gets out of the car and he begins to run. Well, he's kind of a chubby fella. He doesn't run real fast. And all of a sudden, the police officer draws his weapon and begins to fire, and he shoots the man dead in the back as he's running away. And you sit there and you watch this video and you say, that isn't justice. What did this man do? Did, is this man running away from the scene of a, uh, of a multiple shooting where he just killed a bunch of people? No, he was being pulled over on a traffic stop. He may have had a warrant out for his arrest for some little petty thing, you know. And whatever reason, he was afraid and he decided he was going to run. Well, I'm... I'm rather poorly these days. I'm not as fast as I used to be. And I'm going to tell you what, I could have tackled that man. He was not running very fast at all. That police officer did not need to draw his gun and begin to fire on this man. There was no need for that. And we've come to a place in our society today where we see people doing great and wicked things and not paying any price in response to that which they're doing. And then we have others who are doing precious little and they're paying an awful terrible price. That is not justice, folks. Justice is portrayed in the image of the woman holding the balances, holding the scales. Justice is perfect justice is when the scales are even on both sides. You've done something bad. You've done something you ought not to have done. Therefore, your punishment is such to even out the scales. Hello now. It, the, the United States of America has laws on the books, and we have it written into our Constitution, that cruel and unusual punishments are not permissible. It is not supposed to be allowed by the Constitution that a person be punished in a cruel or unusual way. That there ought not to be a punishment that does not fit the crime. Now we've got a man in the White House today who's committed all kinds of garbage over the course of his career. And he consistently seems to be able to get away with every cotton-picking thing he does. Then we have some poor fool who happens to buy or carry a small packet of pot or whatever the case might be, and he winds up in jail for years. That is not justice. That is not the scales being even. That is not the proper punishment being meted out for the crime. We have a message in evangelical and fundamentalist circles today that is very much fashioned after the Roman Catholic practice of scaring the hell out of people, if I may use that phrase. For many centuries, the Catholic Church was able to manipulate and control its members by reason of the uh, doctrine of hell. And teaching people that, oh, if you do this, or you do that, or if you go here, or you go there, if you do any of these things and you do not keep the teaching of the Catholic Church, then you're going straight to the fires of hell. And bless God, hell is going to be nothing but heat and flames and torment for every soul that does not do as we tell them they ought to do. And I've got news for you today. A lot of people who are of the mindset that we preachers are just supposed to keep preaching what's always been preached. Well, that is a loyalty to that is a loyalty to tradition. That is not a loyalty to the Word of God. That's right. I'm going to tell you a little secret today, folks. God is a God of justice. God is a God of balance. God is a God of proper weights. Even in the law of Moses, God instructed his people that they were to use a proper weight, meaning that they could not uh, 
tip the scale in their favor, so to speak, by using the weight. You know, there's an old, uh, back in the day when you used to go to the deli and you'd buy your meat, you know, by the pound, uh, there was an old thing that sometimes if a, if a, a deli operator weren't altogether honest, they'd put their thumb on the scale and they'd kind of press it a little bit. So that way they could add a little bit of weight to the scale and thus they could rob from you. You know, they could steal from you. They could get a little more money than they deserved because they were giving you less product than it appeared they were giving you. Well, we got a message in the evangelical and fundamentalist churches today that much like its Roman Catholic mother <clears throat> suggests that God is an unfair and unjust God and that God uses an unjust weight. And I grew up in a church where, you know, they talk about preaching hellfire and brimstone. I mean, if a preacher got up and preached hellfire and brimstone, my God, then that was a preacher who was doing his job. I'll tell you what, if he scared the life out of you, if he had you run to the altar in fear of losing your soul at the end of that service, then that preacher did his job. Well, I'm here to tell you today that preacher was not doing his job. Matter of fact, that preacher was probably doing more harm than good to his listener. Many, many people give up in their walk with God. They give up in their attempt to live for God and walk this Christian way because they become so discouraged. And they believe that there is no possible way they can win the fight or they can win the race. And they say, Lord, I just can't do it all. All the things you require of me to be saved, I just can't do. And they stop living all together for the Lord. And it's a sad state of affairs because the message of grace is lost on these people. These folks don't even know what grace is. Their pastor does not instruct them as to what grace is. They don't understand today that God is above all else a fair and a just God throughout the Old Testament. God himself says many, many times that he is a just God and a savior. He is a just God. God does not use a false weight. You do not get the maximum punishment for a minimal crime. I do not believe, for instance, I do not believe today, and some are going to choke on their tongue when I say this. Do I believe in hell? Absolutely. The Bible teaches it. I don't care what anybody tries to tell you. Hell is a very real place. The Bible tells us hell is where uh, the, the false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan are going to spend eternity. So it is, in fact, a very real place. People who are not obedient to the gospel of Jesus Christ, will they find themselves in hell? Yes, they will. My problem is in the notion that hell will be the same for everybody. No, hell will not be the same for everybody. And somebody immediately said, oh, this preacher's going off his rocker. This preacher's going away from the word of God. It says hell will be the same for everybody. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Read your Bible again. There are times when the Word of God talks about hell in terms of flames. And there are times when the Word of God refers to hell as a place, listen to me now, of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but flames generate light. And if you have a place of flames, then you cannot possibly have a place that is entirely dark. No, it has, when you have a fire, you have light. If you're out in the woods, if I'm out in my cabin and I want light, all I have to do is light a candle. And even the smallest flame produces light enough to fill the entire cabin. So hell is not 
going to be, I don't believe, the identical same thing for everybody. Because no, the punishment would not, would not then fit the crime. And if the punishment does not fit the crime, then God suddenly is accused of being an unjust God, and God is not an unjust God. And I've heard my entire life growing up, oh, but bless God, if God has gone to such great lengths to save us, and we reject him, then we deserve the fires of hell. No, even God recognizes righteousness or right conduct that's all righteousness means righteousness is not the possession of the church righteousness is right conduct or right behavior when the spirit of the lord sent an angel to talk to cornelius in the book of acts and to instruct cornelius to go and to seek out a man named peter uh the word of God tells us that Cornelius was a godly man. He was a righteous man. He gave alms. He, in other words, he supported the poor. He gave to help the poor and the needy among him. Uh, and God showed this man favor because he was a good man. So that tells you something about God. God recognizes good wherever good may be found. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? Now, can you be saved by good? No! No! All the good works, all the good actions, all the good deeds that you can manufacture will not save your soul. Only the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ is able to redeem lost mankind. Only belief and obedience and acceptance of his gospel will secure your name in the Lamb's Book of Life and allow you a guaranteed ticket on the rapture train. Hallelujah. But that does not mean still that God is not a just God. I've got news for you today. Just as I do not believe that hell will be the same for everyone, neither do I believe that heaven will be the same for everyone. Say, Pastor, of course it'll be the same for everyone. Well, now, I'm sorry, but the Word of God tells me that heaven has 12 foundations. And that it literally occupies what amounts to 12 floors or 12 levels. Uh, obviously, it's going to be different at various levels than it would be uh, at other levels. Just because that's the nature of uh, how things work when they're in levels. You go into a building... The first floor is not going to be identical to the second floor. And the second floor is not going to be identical to the third floor. The furnishings may be different. The people that work in that, on that floor may be different. Whatever the case might be, there will be differences. There will be variations. But now some of you who are watching, who come from the old school fundamentalist and evangelical camp, immediately you're getting your ire up. Boy, you're just getting ticked off. This. He's not preaching the Word of God. Oh, honey, I don't preach anything but the Word of God. I wouldn't dare get up and preach anything but the Word of God. Let me, let me share the Word of God with you today to support what I'm trying to say. Proverbs 24 and verse 12. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth the soul, doth he not know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? What Proverbs is saying is, if you say to God, Lord, I did not know that. He says, does not God, who's, who ponders the heart, in other words, who looks at the heart, does he not consider that? Of course he does. God considers what you knew and what you didn't know. That's why the word of God said, to him that knoweth to do good, and does it not... To him, it is sin. 
That is not an Old Testament passage. That is a New Testament passage. If you know the right thing to do, but you refuse to do it, then to you it is sin. If you know the right thing to do is to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, but you simply refuse to submit and surrender yourself to baptism in Jesus' name because you want to be faithful to family, you want to be faithful to tradition, you want uh, you have some other excuse or some other reason, well then I've got news for you today. Uh, watch out because God will hold you responsible because you knew the right thing to do, but you didn't do it. Again, I point you to the story in the Word of God where Jesus talked about the three servants and his master giving them talents. And two of the men invested the talents that they had, the money as it were, that they had been given. And one simply buried the money that he had been given. And when the master came back and he called his servants into account, two of them came back with a greater amount than they had been left with. Because they invested their master's uh, resources. And they were able to turn it into a greater amount. And then the third servant came along. And the third servant said, here, I'm giving you back exactly what you gave me. See, I know you're a hard man. I know you reap where you have not sown. And I know that, you know, you're the kind of man who's able to turn what you've got into something more. So I knew that uh, I didn't want to make you upset. So I just buried what you gave me so I could give it right back to you. And the, the master said, well, now look at these two men. These two men, both of them, they knew how I was. They knew what I'm, what I'm capable of. They knew how I operate. And they said to themselves, well, it'd be foolish for the master to give us money and expect us to give him back the same amount when he gets home. Because if he were home, he wouldn't just be sitting on that money. He'd be investing it. He'd be expecting a return. So if he gave it to me to care for, then I need to do what he would, what he would be doing with it. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so the master said to the servant, you knew me. You knew me. You knew how I operate. You knew what I expected. And yet, what did you do? You just sat on it. And the Word of God says that that unprofitable servant was cast out. And the Word of God uses the language into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Didn't say he was thrown into the pit of hell. Didn't say he was tossed into fire. No, it said he was cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Weeping and gnashing of teeth is symbolic of regret. People who are full of regret. People who are sorrowful. That servant was placed in a place where he would only know and experience the regret for the conduct that he had offered his master. But you see, the Word of God tells us that this master said, you knew me, you knew what I expected of you. To him that knoweth to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. It's not like you didn't know what I would have expected you to do. It's not like you wouldn't have known what I wanted for you to do. No, you knew good and well what I would like for you to have done with that money, but you did something else anyway. Do you follow what I'm saying today? Amen. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart considereth it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? See, God, the Word of God said, man looks on the outward appearance, God looks on the heart. There's a lot of people today who want to preach LGBT people into hell, and they want to say, no, no, it's not natural. No, you weren't born this way. No, you didn't. Blah, blah, blah. And they have all kinds of explanations for your and my experience today. But you know what? God knows your heart. 
God knows your mind. God knows what you think about it. God knows where you're coming from about it. And he does ponder that. Hello now. He does consider that. He does not go by what this preacher believes about your life or what that preacher believes about your life. He goes by what you believe, what you think. And just because someone can convince you that chewing gum is wrong and you're going to go to hell for chewing gum, that doesn't mean that chewing gum is scripturally wrong and you're actually going to be punished for eternity for chewing gum. Many people in our communities today have been preached into a state of hopelessness and despair. They've given up on God. They've given up on trying to live for God and serve God because somebody convinced them that being who they are is a sin and it's a stench in the nostrils of God. Hallelujah, glory to God. And they can't possibly live for God and be a victorious Christian. Well, I'm going to tell you now, if you believe what they're telling you, then you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But if you don't believe that, God's not going to hold you to that. Hello now. Amen. God looketh upon the heart. Man looks on action. God looks on motivation. Today, those of us who come to church, those of us... Uh, today in our communities who do everything in our power to live for God. Do you think for a moment God does not see that? Do you think for a moment God does not ponder that? Do you think for a moment God doesn't look at your heart and understand where you're coming from and appreciate the effort that you make to walk with Him and to live for Him and to do right? Of course He does. God is a just God. I'm asking the question today, which side is up? When God looks at the scale of your life, what he expects of you versus what you give him, how are you doing? When you look at the scale of your life and you look at that which is godly and holy and right versus that which is not, because I've got news for you today, every human being on planet earth, believer and unbeliever alike, has both sides of that scale in their life. The Apostle Paul said, that which I would do, the evil that I would not do, I do. And the good that I would do, that I do not. What does that mean? He says, that scale in my hand of good and evil is constantly teetering back and forth because I'm human. There's a lot of good I do, but there's a lot of good I would do that I don't do. There are times when I react and I respond to things in a way that I shouldn't react and respond to things. And it's just I have a bad day. I'm not living the way I ought to be living. I'm not thinking the way I ought to be thinking. And I wind up doing or saying something or reacting to something in a way that I ought not to have. But which side is up? Is there more godliness in your life? Is there more doing right in your life? Is there more trying to live for God and do the right thing in your life than there is failing and, and doing the wrong thing? Hello now. Hello now. Think about it for a moment. You see, if you live your life with a purpose and an intent to do right, then guess what? Chances are you're going to do a whole lot more right than wrong. Hello now. Now, if you wake up in the morning and you wake up with the attitude, I don't care how I do, I'm going to do however I want to do. I'm going to go whichever way I want to go. I'm going to tell you, I was out of church for a few years because I believed the lie that because of who I was, I had no place in the kingdom of God. And while I was out of church, I gave myself permission to just do whatever I wanted to do, however I wanted to do it, and I just, you know, wasn't going to live by any rules or regulations. And I got up every morning, and I'm going to tell you, somebody did me dirty, man. I mean, to tell you, I was on them like white on rice. You didn't want to mess with me in those days. I could out cuss you faster than you could cuss yourself, I promise. I was quick at the draw. My mouth was quick at the draw. I could be a bit of a brawler if I wasn't careful, although I... I was always a little nervous about getting too angry and getting too physical because I'd had experiences in my life where I could, I could whip some 
some people and, and I could hurt you if I wanted to. So I was always a little nervous about getting too physical. But I didn't let people push me around. I had somebody one time decide they were going to try to get physical with me and I subdued them real fast and had their face shoved into the floor. And I was holding them down and I said, all right, I'm going to let you up now. You've got two ways to leave this house. You can either go out the door or go out the window. It's going to be your choice. But if you think for one minute you're going to get physical with me again when I let you up, said, you better guess again. You see, Tommy, if I wanted to, I could be an awful violent person. If I wanted to, I could be a rough person. If I wanted to, I could do a lot of things I ought not to do. I could get myself into a whole lot of trouble. But as a child of God, I live my life every day with the intention of doing good. <coughs> I do everything in my power every day to try and make the right choices. Amen? You can tell my allergies are giving me a lot of grief. I get up every morning with the intention of living a godly life and doing godly things and trying. I'm not trying to earn my way into heaven, but I'm trying to make sure that the right side of the scale, the right side, meaning the side where I'm doing right, is always further down than the side where I'm not doing right. Do you understand what I'm telling you? See, a lot of people want to make you believe that when you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, that all of a sudden the right side of the scale goes down to the bottom and the left side never again is able to come down the baloney. The Holy Ghost does not come to make you perfect. The Holy Ghost comes to perfect you. There's a difference. Hello now. The Holy Ghost comes to help you to do the right thing. The Holy Ghost comes to give you the power to do the right thing. But can people who are full of the Holy Ghost still do the wrong thing? Sure they can. Sure they can. Paul was full of the Holy Ghost. And he said, who shall deliver me from this body of death? You see, this flesh is subject to the things of this world. This flesh is subject to sin. But listen further to the word of God today. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, uh, 26 and 27. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? For what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. The human manifestation shall come in the glory of the Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Again. Does this mean you can be saved by good works? No. Does this mean you can be saved by the works of righteousness? No. Why do I say no? Because the Word of God teaches us that we must rightly divide the Word of God. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. But yet, the Word of God tells us the Lord is going to reward or repay Every man, every man, every man, that means every human being on this planet will be repaid according to their works. Well, that's in perfect keeping with the language of the Word of God. The Word of God said, for the wages of sin is death. Well, what is wages? It's payment. It's payment. So he's saying, what will you get paid if you live a life of sin? Death. Death, that's the payment. But the gift of God or the reward of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. But isn't it funny in Proverbs 24, the word of God says that if we don't know something that God certainly considers it. He looks at our heart and he considers what we do and do not know. And then it says, and shall he not 
Render to every man according to his works. Then in Matthew 16 it says that for the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall do what? Reward every man according to his works. Do you see the consistency? Old Testament, New Testament. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. 1 Corinthians 3 and 8. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall, excuse me, and, uh, sure, I'm trying to read two different verses here. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So is the reward going to be the same for everybody? Is heaven going to be the same for everybody? No, no, not at all. Is hell going to be the same for everybody? No, not at all. Because every man is going to receive his own reward for his own labor. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? That's justice. That is the right way of doing things. God expects us as human beings to behave justly. And yet we want to preach that God is an unjust God. That he will punish the Adolf Hitlers of our world in the same identical manner as he will punish someone who believes wrongly. No, I don't quite believe that. That's not what the Word of God said. Revelation 22, verse 12. Jesus is speaking, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Listen. To give every man according as his work shall be. Now, I've just read to you five, excuse me, four passages of Scripture that clearly state God is going to reward every man according to his particular specific behavior and conduct. Salvation is not attained through good works or works of the law. It is not attained by reason of righteous acts. But good works are the manifestation of the presence of God and the love of God in our lives. In the end, reward and punishment are meted out according to the balance between our righteous conduct, meaning our right conduct, and our unrighteous conduct or our wrong conduct. Believers ought to live a li their lives in such a manner as to be deserving of reward. God's perfection and righteousness demand that a servant be paid or rewarded according to his work. Even again in the law of Moses, God said that the workman is worthy of his hire. He said, you don't work somebody and don't pay them. Nobody in the kingdom of God, Jesus said, nobody who's given up wives or houses or lands for the kingdom of God and for the kingdom of heaven's sake. He said, nobody does that without being rewarded in this life and in the life to come. Is heaven going to be the same for everybody? No. Because not everybody has been a missionary who's gone to a foreign land and left their families behind and not been able to attend their father's funeral or their mother's funeral or their brother's funeral because they were on foreign soil trying to bring the gospel to someone who never heard it. Not everyone has lived in huts with grass roofs and had to deal with water leaking down on their head while they're trying to sleep at night because they're trying to bring the gospel to people out in the far-flung regions of our world. Not everybody's done that, Tommy. But those that have are going to be rewarded for doing so. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Is heaven going to be the same? No, it will not be the same. God's perfection and his righteousness demand that a servant be paid or rewarded according to his work. Punishment also is a wage, otherwise known in the King James text as a reward. But for the works of unrighteousness rather than righteousness. So you're getting paid just the same as someone who's being paid for their righteous conduct. You're being paid for your unrighteous conduct. Do you follow what I'm saying? 
Now, do we earn our way into heaven by good works? No, it's not possible. Listen, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 25. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. That means this man lived alt literally as a king, okay? He was very sumptuously wealthy, and he fared sumptuously every day. Every day of his life was a good day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate, full of sores, and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Notice that the beggar died first. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. He was in torments, but he could still see Lazarus. Uh, take a wild guess at part of what was tormenting him. Regret. Regret. I had an opportunity to help that man. Look at him over there. Look at him in comfort. Look at him not being tormented. And here I am in torments. And I could have helped that man while I was living. I had a chance to do something for him. But I didn't. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. And send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue for I am tormented in this flame. Listen. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. The punishment fit the crime. In life you had it all good. You had it all easy. Your entire, every day of your life, you were able to eat the finest foods. Every day of your life, you were able to wear the softest clothing. Every night when you went to bed, you were able to lay upon the softest bed. And you were able to put your head on the softest pillow. And you were able to cover yourself with the most sumptuous linens. And here this poor man was just outside the gate of your home. And he was covered in sores. And all he wanted was to eat the crumbs that fell from your table. And dogs would come. The only comfort he had was dogs coming and licking his sores. Do you think it's not just now that he should be comforted and you tormented? Do you follow what I'm telling you? The punishment fit the crime. I want to continue. I'm almost done. Well, no, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not going to lie to you today. I'm not almost done. Titus 2, verses 3 through 7. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, meaning diverse, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another, but after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. Isn't it funny? In the same identical passage, he says, God our Savior. And then he said, Jesus Christ our Savior. And God said in the Old Testament, I'm alone up here. He said, I am God and there's no Savior beside me. Verse 7, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs 
according to the hope of eternal life. Do we earn our way by reason of works of righteousness into salvation? No, we do not. No, we do not. But once we've been saved, there is an expectation that the scale will always be weighted more to the right than to the wrong. Do you understand what I'm telling you today? We ought to be living our lives with the intention every morning of doing good and doing that. Doesn't mean we're always going to hit the mark. That doesn't mean we're always going to reach our goal. It doesn't mean every single day, every single time. But if we wake up every morning with that intention, then the chances are we'll hit it more often than not. Do you follow what I'm saying? I began to say a little while ago when I was out of church, you know, uh, I let myself do whatever I wanted to do, and I, I lived without rules. And I literally, you know, I woke up in the morning, and, and I didn't have that intention. I didn't have that commitment. I'm going to do the right thing, and I'm going to, you know, live a godly life, and I'm going to do what God would have me to do, and what pleases the Lord. I'm going to, I'm going to live my life in such a way that I'm a testimony to the young believer. I, I wasn't living with that thought in mind. And boy, howdy, I'm going to tell you, did I do some crazy, wild, horrible, sinful, hurtful things to any number of people. <clears throat> In Ephesians 2, 4 through 9, the word of God reads, But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. And hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Honey, you cannot be saved. Don't sit there and say, well, I think I've done more good in my life than I have done bad. I think I've, co I've committed more righteous acts than I have unrighteous. And think that that is going to somehow get you a ticket to glory. It doesn't work that way. You've got to come in through the waterway. You've got to come in through God's way. You've got to enter by the gate. Hallelujah. You've got to enter by the door. Jesus said, I am the door. Hallelujah. said, anybody that comes up any other way is a thief and a robber. If you're going to get into the kingdom of God, if you're going to spend eternity in the presence of the Lord, you've got to believe, embrace, and obey the wonderful apostolic gospel of the Lord. Jesus Christ. But once you're a child of God, there is also an expectation of you, not that you would earn heaven, but that you would tip the scales. And you know something? God's grace, listen to me now, this is an interesting reality, is like that thumb on the scale. You see, because God has saved us, he keeps his thumb on the scale. His favor is always with us. So, Booby, even when we fall short, we're not quite as short as we might have been. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even when we don't do just like we ought to do, God said, that's all right. You'll do better tomorrow. Hello now. Amen. Which side is up? When you look at your life as a child of God, which side is up? Do you do more of what you know you ought to do? Or are you constantly doing less of what you know you ought to do? And more of what you know you ought not to do? Hello now. I'm going to tell you, God will help you to get that scale turned the other way if you let him. Amen. The Word of God declares today in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 16. Or 6. Let me see. I better put my glass on. Matthew 5 and verse 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works 
and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So you see again, it's not saying you got to do good works in order to make heaven, but it's saying that in doing good works and doing good things and behaving righteously, we bring glory to God. Ephesians 2 verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. 2 Timothy 3.17, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Titus 1 verse 16, they profess that they know God, but in works they deny him. In actions they deny him. Being abominable and disobedient and unto every, every good work reprobate. So you can call LGBT people abominable all you want to. But they're not reprobate unto every good work. No, they go to church. They serve the Lord. They tithe. They pray. They seek God. Hello now. Right. They love their neighbor. They help people. Uh, this says unto every good work reprobate. Meaning they were ignored and, and had no use for any good work. Do you understand what I'm telling you mm -hmm. today? Uh -huh. I want to tell you, God is mindful of the scale. God is a just God. God is a fair God today. Titus chapter 2, verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Tommy sometimes gets aggravated with me a little bit because I, I have a terrible habit, and, and God knows I probably charge myself into oblivion sometimes because when I see a need, I tend to be rather zealous in trying to meet that need. I, I want to meet the need. I, I want to do something. If it means I have to go into debt doing it, then so be it. But I'm going to do everything in my power to meet the need had some people online who have been following our ministry for many years and they notified me that their computer had broken and they weren't able to watch our services online uh, so they were trying to use their phone to watch our services and they're way, way out in uh, Iowa or, or some part of the country like that and they said we're trying to watch the service on our phone but the, the, it keeps breaking up and you know we're doing our best to be faithful in watching. And I read the message he sent me and immediately I got on my computer and I started doing some stuff and Tommy looked over at my laptop and he said, what are you doing? I said, oh, nothing. He said, I know what you're doing. You're, you're looking to try to get them a computer, aren't you? I said, well, yeah, you know. They're like church members. They're, they might as well be sitting here this afternoon because I know when I'm preaching to that camera, I know they're watching. And they count on the ministry that we offer. And I say, I want them to be able to watch the service. I want them to be able to benefit. I want them to be able to uh, be part of our church online. And I was able to find a little laptop, and it didn't cost a whole, whole lot. And I was able to order it and have it sent to them. We ought to be zealous of good works. If you're a child of God, you ought to be anxious. You ought to be excited about doing good things. Hello now. It ought to be something in you. There ought to be something in you that literally jumps at the opportunity to do something good for somebody. See, that's what the Holy Ghost will do for you. The Holy Ghost gets up inside of you and all of a sudden you'll feel yourself motivated to do good every time you turn around. Every time an opportunity presents itself, the Holy Ghost of God in you is going to be saying, Hey, there's an opportunity for you to do good. There's an opportunity for you to be a blessing. Tommy and I have had conversations over the years. I'm trying to close. 
We've had conversations over the years. Uh, co-workers have lost loved ones, um, husbands, wives, whatever the case might be. And I've said to him, well, are you going to the wake or are you going to the funeral? He'll say, well, no. Uh, I, you know, I didn't work that closely with them. They're in another department, whatever. And I'll say, poopy, poopy, no. <laughs> There's an opportunity for you to do good. There's an opportunity for you to be a comfort to somebody, to be an encouragement to somebody. Don't you realize how good it might make them feel? Well, do you know Tommy came to the wake, or Tommy came to the funeral, and bless his heart, he and I don't even work that close. We don't even know each other that well. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, I'm not rebuking him for, for not, but what I'm trying to say is that as a child of God, we ought to be zealous, for good works. There ought to be something in us that motivates us to want to do right. I'm going to tell you something. If you have to sit and fight and argue with yourself about tithing, something's wrong. I'm going to tell you, if you got to fight with yourself about putting a dollar or two in the offering plate uh, when, the, when the ministry and the church has a need, something's wrong. Ever since I was a kid, Tommy, and I had a, a, a paper route and I had a little money in my pocket. You let the pastor get up and say there was a need in the church. And I'm going to tell you something. I would empty my wallet every time. Every time. You know why? Because I'm zealous of good works. I, I want to do. I know, hey, I know God is always going to keep the, the scales of justice balanced. I know that he's never going to let me give that he doesn't give back. He's never going to allow me to get ahead of him. Hello now. God blesses those who are a blessing. But we have people in the church who, I mean to tell you, let the preacher talk about tithing and they just start gritting their teeth and they start getting upset. I'm going to tell you, when I was a kid and I got a paper out, one of the very first things, I kid you not, that meant probably the first thing that I got excited about, literally got excited about, was I could now tithe. I'm 11 years old. And I felt like a man. I felt like a grown-up. I said, hallelujah, now I can tithe. Now I can give to God. Now I can give to the church. I'm not earning my way into heaven, but I'm showing the Lord I love him. I'm showing him that this message that I have believed, that I have embraced, that I have obeyed, is so important to me, and, and I want the whole world to hear it. And how shall they hear except someone tell them? And how can someone tell them except they be sent? If that message is going to go forth, it needs support. And Booby, I was excited about being able to tithe. I'll never forget it as long as I live. Yeah, God wants peculiar people. He wants a unique people. The word peculiar in this passage refers to unique you see, the world doesn't live like the church lives. The unbeliever doesn't act like the believer. God's people don't act like people of the world. We have a whole different way of looking at things. But he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar or a unique people. And what makes us unique? Zealous of good works. Every time God's people have a chance to do good, they do it. Somebody looks at you and says, boy, I'll tell you what, every time that guy has an opportunity, he, he tries to do good by somebody. Do you follow what I'm telling you today? That's the Christian life. That's what God's looking for. <sighs> Titus 3 and 8 this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. 
Hebrews 10, 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. You know one of the reasons we're part of a church, you know one of the reasons we come to church and we worship together and we fellowship is because in the process of this, we encourage one another to two things. We encourage one another to love and we encourage one another to do good things. A lot of times, if we don't put ourselves in a place where we're being encouraged to do good things, guess what happens? We fall out of the practice of doing good things. But when you come to church sometimes and somebody says, well, you know, this fellow at my job lost his wife uh, this week and he's missed a few days' work so things have been kind of busy. You might not even think about this, but all of a sudden that brother or that sister will say, Oh, well, it sure would be sweet if you'd go to the funeral. It sure would be nice if you'd go to the wake. Because that would really encourage them. Do you follow what I'm saying? What are we doing? We're encouraging one another to good works. We're trying to encourage one another to do something good. To, to where you, just trying to show you. Sometimes you don't see where there's an opportunity for you to be a blessing. Sometimes you don't see where there's an opportunity for you to be a testimony to somebody. But maybe a saint who's been in the church longer. Maybe somebody who's been in the way a little bit longer. Maybe they'll turn around and say, well, you know, that would be a wonderful opportunity for you to be a witness to them for you to be a testimony to them you know and this is what it's all about lastly this afternoon I just want to remind you of this divine judgment is perfect judgment some people hearing this message say oh if you don't preach fire and brimstone if you don't preach hellfire then people are going to just do their own thing and they're not going to live like they ought to live they're not going to do like they ought to do no you're just giving people a license to sin. No, 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 no. Not that million miles. I've said it as plainly today as I can say it. If you would be saved, if you would find your name in the Lamb's Book of Life, you must obey, you must believe, you must obey this gospel. But if you're a child of God... If you're living for the Lord, God does have a certain expectation of you. And that expectation is that you wake up every morning with the intention and the purpose of heart to do good. And to do right by people. It doesn't mean you're going to hit the mark every day. We all have bad days. We all, we all go through depression. We all go through disappointment. We all get hungry and, and get, uh, you, know, I, I, you know, attitudes get out of whack. But I'm here to tell you, don't take the lazy way out and think, well, bless God, I gave to this man on the I gave a dollar to this man on the street seven months ago, so it don't matter that every day I cuss people and I chew people up and I brawl with people and I get into fights and I screw people around in my business and I do people dirty and uh, because after all I gave a dollar to that guy. And that'll outweigh it. No, no. God's judgment is divine judgment, and divine judgment is perfect. Listen lastly today to what the word of the Lord says. In Luke chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, In the meantime, when there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trode one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy, talking one thing and doing something else. For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Let me tell you something, folks. If you think you're going to con God, if you think you're going to con God in the judgment and you're going to convince him, he asks the question, which side is up? Is the right side of your scale up? 
lower than the left side? Is the right side where you're doing the right things? Is it lower than the side where you're doing the wrong thing? And you think you're going to con God. God's going to say, oh, honey, <laughs> let me tell you a little secret. You're not talking to a judge who doesn't know the facts. You're not talking to a judge who doesn't have access to every single ounce of evidence. No, divine judgment is perfect judgment. Why? Because there is nothing that is hid from God. He knows every good deed you've done, deeds that nobody ever saw, things you thought you would never receive the least bit of reward or repayment or recognition for, God saw it. Things that you did so many years ago, you forgot about it. You're going to stand before God in the judgment, and the Lord's going to say, Do you remember when you did this? Lord, I, I forgot all about that. It, it didn't even cross my mind. He says, it didn't, it didn't pass me. I saw it. When we stand before God and those scales are held in our hand, and he says, which side is up? Don't think for a minute you're going to be able to con God into thinking that you've done more than you've done. We've got a president today who wants to try to make people believe that he's charitable and that he's giving. And yet we have charities that he claims to have given to who have said plainly, this man gave us nothing. He actually crashed charitable events in order to be found in pictures in the paper. So it would appear that he supported these organizations. And then the organization said, yeah, he crashed our event. He was not invited. But he showed up so he could be in pictures. And he never gave one thin dime. But this fool will think he can stand in front of God and he can con God. Honey, it doesn't work that way. I asked the question this afternoon. Which side is up? Are you zealous today of good works? Have you made your mind you want to be part of God's unique family? You want to live your life by the unique lifestyle of giving and being a blessing, as the Word of God calls us. Not to earn your salvation. Your salvation is through faith alone. It's by grace alone. But so that one day you can receive a reward. Hallelujah.